We're here in a state in the Pacific Northwest that has a pretty complete geologic record, ranging from fossils from the Cambrian all the way to the Holocene. Its state fossil is the mammoth. Welcome to the Evergreen State! Washington has a rather complex paleontological record, with fossils spanning from the Cambrian through the Holocene. One thing to keep in mind before we dive into Washington's paleontological history is that Washington and the rest of the Pacific Northwest actually hasn't been there the whole time. Instead, parts of other tectonic plates have been mashed onto the North American plate, expanding its size. These added on rocks are called accreted terrains. One way we know that these land masses came from far away is because their fossils look a lot more like those from other places than nearby ones. This is especially true of Washington's Cambrian trilobites. During this time, we also have animals called archaeocyathids. We don't really know what they are, but they look a lot like sponges. One of the most common fossils in the Ordovician of Washington are graptolites. They look like lines on the rocks, but are related to acorn worms. Graptolites persist into the Silurian period, a time that is not well represented in the state. In the Devonian, we find brachiopods and the appearance of rugose coral. Brachiopods are marine shelly creatures and are not related to clams. Instead, they possess a filter feeding structure known as a lophophore and have different shaped top and bottom shell valves, but are symmetrical on the right and left side. These animals are still alive today and are sometimes eaten by humans. Rugos coral, or horn coral, is an extinct form of solitary coral, although there were a few species that were colonial. Corals and brachiopods are also commonly found in rocks of the Carboniferous, as are bryozoans. Bryozoans are related to brachiopods and also have a filter feeding lophophore, but are colonial animals like corals and are often confused with, for one another. Snails, corals, and foraminiferal plankton called fusilinids can be found from the Permian period. Entering the Mesozoic era with the Triassic period, the most common fossils in Washington are bivalves. Most other Mesozoic fossils are marine in Washington, like cephalopods, but there has been a theropod dinosaur found in the San Juan Islands from the Cretaceous. We don't really have a good fossil record for the Paleocene epoch. However, in the Eocene, we see a greater presence of terrestrial fossils. One of the most well-known fossil sites in Washington is Stone Rose in Republic Washington. Here, leaves, fruits, flowers, insects, and fish are preserved in the 50 million year old shale of the Klondike Mountain Formation. At Stone Rose Interpretive Center, you can learn about the fossils and even pay a small fee to go and collect fossils there yourself. The staff will show you how to collect the fossils and help with identification. We will have a link to their site in the description below. Marine mollusks are also known from the Eocene and other parts of the state. Snails, the cephalopod Aturia, clams, barnacles, crabs, and chinoderms, whales, and albatross fossils have all been found from the Oligocene and Miocene strata in Washington. Our episode today will focus on the mid-Miocene forests of Washington. So right now we're on our way to the Ginkgo Petrified Forest State Park in Vantage, Washington. A forest once stood here at Ginkgo Petrified Forest State Park in Washington. It was a forest full of ginkgos, elms, sequoias, and lots of other species of tree. They're eventually covered by flows of basalt. Basalt is a type of rock that's formed by lava that's low in silica. We'll come back to this forest just in a sec. Lavas also during this time actually preserved a rhino, which is a rare occurrence in paleontology because lava often burns organic matter. Only the mold of the rhino is preserved, but it's still a fossil. Moving on to the Pliocene, fish fossils have been found. However, not too many fossils are known from this time either. During the Pleistocene, a portion of the Cordillerian ice sheet periodically came in and scraped up parts of Washington. But that wasn't the only thing that happened on a periodic basis. 
water would become dammed up in Missoula, Montana. And when that ice dam broke, water would come gushing down at about 80 miles per hour, making its way to the Pacific Ocean. Along the way, it would take up boulders and soil and scour the land. It would carve out canyons and deep trenches. It also unveiled the petrified forest here at the park that's about 15.5 million years old. In terms of fossils, bison, rhino, mastodons, and the state fossil, the Colombian mammoth can be found. But now, let's try to find some of that Miocene petrified wood with Greg Wilson and Tom Wilkin of the Northwest Paleontological Association. So what got you guys into paleontology? Mm, well, it started for me when I was pretty young. Uh, my parents were both interested in a lot of natural sciences and such, especially fossils, and they would take us on uh, road trips. Every summer we'd go on one or two. We'd go to state parks and uh, capitals and uh, any place that we could go and find fossils, we would go and check them out. And so that's been with me ever since. And Tom? Uh, well, you know, everybody loves fossils and dinosaurs when you're a little kid, and sometimes life gets in the way, and then you come back to it later. So I started uh, volunteering at the, the Burke Museum, Museum Cleaning Dinosaur Bones, and from there joined the Fossil Club and became president of the Fossil Club and the NPA, the Northwest Paleontological Association. And I've gotten to go into uh, on three digs into Montana for dinosaur bones with the Burke Museum and the University of Washington professors. So we're now across the Columbia River outside of a town called Mattawa and we are on the Saddle Mountain BLM land and so whenever you go find fossils it's really important that you keep a record of where you are. So we've written down the GPS coordinates of where we are. We just pulled this off from from our cell phones and what we're now doing is we're working on a free exposed pit. And so you can see what what uh, Tom and Victor are doing right now is they're just making the pit wider and they're just looking for pieces of petrified wood that are in the pit. And there's some pieces on top as well that you can collect. So it's okay to dig on BLM. However, you do need to be aware of the areas that you can collect. And right now we are in an area where we can collect, uh, but there are areas where you can't and we'll have a link to the map in the description below of where you are. So kind of going with our techniques right now, there's some pits that are dug right here. Uh, we can see Tom, earlier he was brushing the side of this pit and right now he's just going along with a little trowel and digging along. But you don't always have to dig to find petrified wood. We've been picking up pieces throughout the day just right on the surface as well. Um, this is actually a small piece of wood right here that was just down in the ground. Uh, we can't really tell what it is because the grain isn't, isn't preserved. We don't have really good cell structure. Oh, and it looks like Tom just found a shard right there. A lot of this has been opalized and totally replaced by silica, but these are still, these are still fossils. Why do you think that it's important for people to find fossils and to be able, the ability to collect fossils? Hmm. Probably just the, the wonder of seeing something that's one, two, five, a hundred, five hundred million years old that was living at that place and just to learn about uh, what it represents for evolution and the state of things. It's time spans that the human brain isn't really set up to contemplate. So it's a good way to stretch, stretch your boundaries and that sense of wonder Greg talked about. It's when you're a kid, everything is wonderful. Everything's new. Everything's mind bending. And as you get older, you get a little bit jaded. So it's nice to go back and find something that you don't understand or maybe you can't understand. All right, so what we're looking at right here is this is a, a, a limb cast or wood cast, uh, but it's been completely replaced with agate. So sadly, we don't have any cell structure in it so we can't say what type of, of tree this was but it still is a fossil and it's also very pretty. What is the coolest thing or some of the coolest things that you have done with Northwest Paleontological Association? 
maybe one of the funnest things is going up to uh, Madeline Falls in the northeast corner of the state and finding trilobites in Washington. There's only a few places that that can be found and it's neat that Washington was that old at one place. Uh, doing uh, field trips with the NPA is always great. We have uh, uh, the lectures as well that we have five times a year and that's wonderful. But the field trip to Stone Rose, we go at Stone Rose is a fossil site in north uh, eastern Washington and it's a public science dig site and that's a pretty fantastic field trip. We usually get a dozen or more of our NPA members attending that so it becomes a social and a fossil outing at the same time. So another technique that we can do is a technique called probing. And so, well, I'm actually just going to brush the side off right now, and then I can start poking around. And when I hear clink, that means I hit something. Now, this is, this is just basalt, so we're not really interested into that right now. Um, but there is a piece of wood, and we could also see that that was a little bit uh, different color than than that basalt. This has a little bit of white on it. But the wood is being preserved with different minerals. Uh, so it's not just one color that we're looking for. We're, we're looking for lots of, of different colors. So another important thing to talk about is telling the difference between the basalt and the wood because we find both at the same site. So with the basalt, that's going to have a different color and texture than the wood. So we can see this particular piece of basalt is porous. It's porphyritic basalt. Uh, that's where a lot of gases were stored and popped out. And it's also very dark in color. Now the wood's also is going to have many different colors, but it's also going to have a different texture. So this particular piece is orange, uh, but we also find some that are white. Some pieces also look more more agatized and more and more clear, more transparent. Uh, this particular piece also has a lot of grain on it. It definitely looks looks like wood. Another difference between the wood and the basalt is the sounds that they make. So I'm going to tap it with a hammer. So that's kind of a dull and hollow sound. And that's definitely a higher, higher pitched clink. And so you can do that test in the field, in the holes while you are, while you are digging. So Tom is going to demonstrate how we're going to clean off the wood uh, using a brush and just some regular water. This is a root burrow we found. And it's, it's a very interesting piece. I'm anxious to see how it cleans up. Uh, so this is a burl. This is some uh, chunk of wood here. This is where the wood is broken. So that's the opalized piece. So this would be really glassy. So we'll get some of this off. And there's a, a strange structure over here. I'd like to see what that looks like. So let's pour a little water on and see the color come out. And a little bit of brushwork. Get a lot of the dirt off just with the brush and the shape starts to come out. You never know what you have until you clean it up. But this one shows a lot of promise. So, Wow, that looks great. Look at all the color in it. Oh yeah. And then look at the, look right in here. Look how that cleaned up. That's just, you can see right into the glassy structure there. So do a little bit more brushing. And one more pour of the water and then we're ready to pack it up and take it home and do a final cleaning. But this is a great way to see what you're finding and kind of keep your uh, spirits up when you find a really cool piece. It's neat to explore what you have in the field. There you go. Nice. All right, guys, that's our show for today. Thank you for watching. Please remember to like, comment, subscribe. Check out our website at www.myfossil.org. You can also follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. This time we would like to give a special shout out to uh, Jim Godert and, and Tim Fisher, who were very influential in helping us find sites. And especially shout out to uh, NPA, Northwest Paleontological Association. We'll have a link to their site in the description below. Also, if you want to go digging wood, uh, do recommend contacting them first just so that you know that you are on the right place at the BLM land. Also, additional thanks to, well, specifically to, to Tom 
and to Greg for taking their time to being with us and for Peg Johnson for driving us out here today. So remember to like, comment, subscribe. We'll see you out in the field and be a paleontologist. Thanks for watching. <laughs>